Navi just made history by winning the first ever Counter-Strike 2 Major, marking a new era in competitive gaming. We literally stand at the crossroads of history and innovation, witnessing the evolution of strategy and competition. But what if I told you that the heart of Counter-Strike beats in sync with a game as ancient as civilization itself? Welcome to an exploration where it's pixels meets pawns, and it's Brains versus Brawn, this is where the digital battlegrounds of Counter-Strike converge with a timeless strategic depth of chess. At its heart, Counter-Strike is less about the solitary pursuit of frags and more about the orchestration of complex strategies, the management of resources, and the psychological interplay between teams. Yes, aim and mechanics are more refined in Counter-Strike than any other FPS game, training to tap troop, spray control, strafe, bunny hop, and so much more. This is what gives CS such a high skill ceiling, but at the end of the day, it's more about positioning and team play than anything else. Flashing it again. Never mind. I can flash it. Flash it. To the eyes of many, Counter Strike might just appear as another shooty game like Call of Duty. Nice. Bro, what's with the fake defuse? What game are you playing? I'm playing Counter Strike. What do you think I'm playing? <laughs> However, this is such a surface level comparison and denies the rich tapestry of strategy, team dynamics, and tactical depth that truly defines Counter Strike. Setting it apart from not just the other shooters, but aligning it more closely with the intellectual and strategic demands of chess. In chess, each player commands an army of pieces. Like the in-game leader in CS coordinates strategies with his team, a chess player uses each piece with its own unique roles. Pawns, knights, bishops, rooks, a queen, and a king. Each piece a crucial part of the strategic arsenal, moving across the board with a singular goal of checkmating the opposing king. Chess is a game of infinite possibilities and deep strategic planning, where anticipation, foresight, and the art of sacrifice dictate the flow of the game. Counter-Strike, on the other hand, plunges players into a world of tactical team-based combat. Two teams, terrorists, whose objective is to plant and successfully detonate the bomb on one of two bomb sites, and counter-terrorists with the responsibility of preventing that bomb plant or defusing the bomb. You go send the girl. It's done! With a vast arsenal at their disposal, players must navigate complex maps, utilize strategic utility like smoke grenades, flashbangs, and work in unison to outwit and outgun the opposition. At its core, Counter-Strike isn't just about sharp shooting, but about the strategic depth, teamwork, and adaptability. Dominating the chessboard with your queen, sweeping across the board, able to strike in any direction, I think mirrors the art of the agile op, repositioning around the map in Counter-Strike, both acts of strategic positioning, turning these players into gatekeepers, masters of their domain who can sway the outcome of the game with a single, well-placed strike. This is just one of the many parallels showcasing the essence of strategic foresight and spatial dominance that unifies these two games. To the uninitiated, these parallels between these two games might seem tenuous at best, and you might want to point out the obvious differences, like obviously you can't whiff in chess, and if you make the best possible play in CS, you can still fail to capitalize. Or the fact that in chess, you're aware of all the positionings of all the pieces, whereas in CS, gathering information of the enemy's positioning is crucial. Yet, as we delve deeper, we uncover a shared foundation of strategy, positioning, and psychological warfare. From the importance of map control and pawn structure to the critical moments of clutch plays to massive blunders. I think knight f1 is a huge is blunder. A blunder. He jumps, oh he, he hit the roof. He missed, he No, did. that's he missed such high. a blunder. Chess and Counter-Strike are united by the intellectual challenge they pose to their players. Whether you're a seasoned Grandmaster or a veteran of countless Counter-Strike matches or knew the realms of strategy and competition, join us on a journey to explore the fascinating intersections between these two games. Discover the strategies that define champions, the psychological battles that turn the tide, and the communities that have turned these games into more than just pastimes. They've become a way of life. Let's dive into our first chapter, Map Control versus Pawn Structure. Imagine the chessboard, a battleground of 64 squares where the pawns form the front lines. These aren't just pieces, they're the soul of chess, shaping the battlefield, controlling the space, and dictating the tempo of the war that unfolds. 
A strong pawn structure is like a fortress, protecting your pieces while constricting your opponent's moves. In the realm of chess, pawns might seem like the least powerful pieces, given their limited range of movement. However, their strategic positioning can create structures that define the battlefield, control key squares, and dictate the tempo of the game. In one of the pivotal games between Viswanathan Anand and Magnus Carlsen during the World Championship matches, Anand's pawn structure played a critical role in the outcome. Anand, known for his deep opening preparation and tactical prowess, often utilizes his pawns to control the center and open lines for his pieces. However, in facing Carlsen, he encountered a player with an exceptional ability to challenge conventional wisdom and capitalize on the slightest imbalances. Carlsen's approach to chess, focusing on creating positions that are uncomfortable for his opponents and pushing them into mistakes. Carlsen contested the central area, but also subtly undermined Anand's pawn structure. This seemingly minor action had profound implications gradually restricting Anand's peace mobility and leading to positional weaknesses that Carlsen expertly exploited. Now Australis, during their peak, revolutionized how teams approached map control. Their playstyle mirrored the chess philosophy of controlling key areas to dictate the flow of the game. They're sneaking behind. This setup's not really designed to cover off for a fast play out of the apartment's aerial. He's got to be perfect blast, blinded off. Didn't even see them get in. They got behind him. Sergei found only one, but aerial steps back up, unfortunately. By utilizing coordinated utility throws, smokes, flashbangs, and grenades, and synchronized movements, Astralis was able to gain territory and pressure opponents into making unfavorable decisions. Three versus three, but a massive advantage here for Astralis. The retake begins, the orbs up, but another smoke is down. How do they break through the force field of the smoke towards the arch side? Now focus towards quad, but maybe if he gets one of these kills, the round can be done. Looking for both of them, he absolutely nails it. Lovely approach of Mastralis. They've got so much money, so much momentum behind them. They get the apartment's control, one smoke out, a flashbang to follow, and they make things so difficult to contain. It's that Molotov towards a pit that removed Ariel from the equation. Why does this matter? Because in both Chess and Counter-Strike, the battle for control is where the victories are forged. It's not just about having the most pieces or the best aim. It's about what you do with the space those advantages give you. It's about making the entire battlefield work for you, turning every square, every pixel into a tool for your victory. Like in chess, controlling the center is a fundamental principle taught from the earliest lessons. It's here that the game's most potent dynamics unfold, allowing pieces maximum mobility and influence. Anatoly Karpov, renowned for his positional prowess, masterfully demonstrated this in his games, using central control as a launch pad for attacks that would slowly suffocate his opponents. His game against Viktor Korchnoi in the 1978 World Championship is a prime example where Karpov's grip of the center allowed him to maneuver his pieces into dominant positions, orchestrating attacks from a place of strength and flexibility. More on this match later. Counter-Strike's parallel lies in the tactical significance of mid control, particularly on maps like Mirage, where control of mid offers teams a variety of strategic openings for attacking bomb sites. The ESL Pro League Season 16 saw Team Vitality Zaiwu Utilizing mid control on Mirage to create openings and apply pressure, showcasing how mid control serves as a linchpin for both defensive holds and offensive maneuvers. No, that's the thing, and that, that we're going to see what the play is this time because, again, this mid position has been so heavily defended. Zaiwu comes up from connector this time to look at the underpass, and he might get one now. No mistake on it, Elise. Gone. Challenge. Flash. His ability to pick off opponents from mid, coupled with his team's coordinated utility usage, underscores how controlling these central areas provide a strategic advantage, enabling the team to pivot attacks based on enemy positioning and response. These examples highlight the universal truth across both games. Control the center, and you control the flow of the game. This central dominance allows for greater operational flexibility, forcing opponents into reactive positions, and opening avenues for strategic exploitation. <laughs> In the opening gambit, both chess grandmasters and Counter-Strike tacticians laid down their first cards, initiating plays that resonate with intent and foresight. In chess, the board is the blank canvas. Openings like the Sicilian defense or the Queen's gambit unfold as intricate dances. These aren't mere moves, they're declarations of war, each with its own history, philosophy, and counter-strategies. The Sicilian defense, a favorite among players who thrive on counterattacks, disrupts the symmetry of the game, inviting a complex battle of wits that can sway in any direction. Counter-Strike mirrors his opening complexity in its early round strategies, 
the decision to rush B or take mid sets the tempo and dictates the narrative of the confrontation. Selecting a default setup or a site rush in Counter-Strike reflects a team's tactical disposition, their readiness to adapt, and their willingness to seize control from the onset. Take, for instance, the iconic chess match where Deep Blue, an IBM supercomputer, squared off against then-world chess champion Garry Kasparov. Deep Blue challenges Kasparov's brain with an array of 256 processors that can examine 200 million possible moves every second. They call it the brute force approach. This match is famously remembered for Deep Blue's victory, but it's the nuanced strategies, especially in Game 6, that truly underscores the complexities of chess. Deep Blue's decision to employ the Cairo Khan defense in reaction to Kasparov's E4 opening was not merely a showcase on computational might, but a testament to the strategic depth. This choice laid the groundwork for the game, steering the flow and cornering Kasparov into a series of moves that led to his downfall. In the early moves of game six, playing by its book of openings, then in the mid game, analyzing millions of possible scenarios by sheer brute force, Deep Blue has led Kasparov into making a poor move. In a parallel universe of strategy and foresight, we observe similar brilliance during the PGL Major Krakow 2017 final between Gambit Esports and Immortals. Specifically in Map 2 on Train, where Gambit Esports executed a strategy that mirrored the foresight seen in chess. Just as Deep Blue's Cairo Khan defense was a strategic response to an initial challenge, Gambit Esports' tactical play after losing a force buy round to Immortals illustrates the criticality of economic decisions in CS. We have a force buy in return here, a couple of AKs coming out. Not everyone fully committed, I have to say. By force buying back against Immortal's successful force buy, they then made an early round call. Understanding the tempo and flow of the map, Gambit was able to set up a Dren and Pop Dog to secure an opening frag. By specifically countering Immortal's strategy, Gambit not only regained control but shifted the momentum in their favor. This forced Immortals into an eco round and paved the way for Gambit to clinch the next four rounds. A Dren scored him out in the previous map, but he finds that opening pick gets in the 5 on 4. And like you said, slow, methodical gameplay coming at that point as well. Alright, before we hop back into the subject matter, I just want to take a quick moment. If you guys have been following me or know me at all, you guys know I'm passionate about creating my own gaming mouse, the Aero One Wireless. Uh, it's been so long, and I've been like, it's been a long time coming. I don't have much to say other than check out the trailer. In the era of gaming domination, control, precision, and speed are not just desires, they are demands. Experience control like never before. This is the mouse that defines a generation. Make it your era. Moving to probably the most obvious comparison in my opinion, sacrifice and trading. In the high stakes arenas of chess and Counter-Strike, Sacrifices are the bull's strokes that define legends, turning the tide of battles with a single, calculated risk. Chess embodies the strategic depth of sacrifice beautifully. One of the most iconic sacrifices in chess history occurred during the 1956 Game of the Century between 13-year-old Bobby Fischer and Donald Byrne. Fischer's sacrificial offering of his queen on move 17 bewildered onlookers, yet this daring move dismantled Burns' defenses, showcasing an unparalleled vision of the board that led Fisher to a triumphant victory through superior positioning and tactical foresight. This game epitomizes how chess sacrifices, though initially seems like a loss, can open pathways to an overwhelming advantage, orchestrating a victory from the jaws of defeat. Round 10 of the Heroic vs. Outsiders match at the Rio Major 2022 stands out as a microcosm of high-level Counter-Strike strategy, mirroring the depth of sacrifices in chess. The round begins with a bold double push from Stalin and Shush on A-Ramp. 
They successfully take down Norbert and tip the initial advantage to Heroic. Early aggression resembles chess openings where pieces are developed to control key areas of the board. Keekert gets a timely kill on Shush, exploiting an opening. His success is short-lived as Stown quickly trades him off, showcasing the importance of maintaining pressure. The ensuing back and forth trades between Stahl, Flit, and Tessas further highlight the tactical back and forth, reminiscent of exchanging pieces in chess to gain positional and material advantage. Now, in a 2v2 scenario, Yabi's crucial kill on Jaime shifts the balance, but then, Fame 1v2. Time sensitive mission. Kit picked up. Oh, spots them both. Deep Eliminates plan. one. Fame holding his nerve in his first major. Never mind the grand final. He's lost him. He's completely lost him. Fame evaporates the invisible man. Clutching up for the outsiders <laughs> with pinpoint precision. That's nuts. Fame's victory underscores the significance of individual skill and strategic depth, like a well executed endgame in chess. Both games through these acts of sacrifice teach us the value of foresight, strategy, and the courage to embrace temporary loss for a greater strategic advantage. The willingness to sacrifice in chess and Counter-Strike is not born of desperation, but of deep understanding of the game and an unshakable confidence in one's own ability to turn the tides of battle, embodying the essence of strategic mastery that transcends the confines of the board and the screen. <laughs> As we navigate the labyrinths of strategy and sacrifice, we encounter yet another battleground that transcends the physical, the realm of psychological warfare and bluffs. Here, mind is the weapon and perception the battlefield. Chess grandmasters and Counter-Strike pros alike wield the art of psychological manipulation with the precision of a scalpel, dissecting their opponent's resolve with moves that are as much about influencing the mind as they are about altering the state of play. The chessboard in the digital arena becomes stages for a complex dance of deception, where what is shown masks the true intent, and what is hidden holds the power. I mentioned we would come back to this legendary match between Viktor Korchnoi and Anatoly Karpov in the 1978 World Championship. It serves as a masterclass in psychological tactics as Korchnoi, known for his resilience and mental fortitude, employs psychological strategies ranging from wearing reflective sunglasses to bringing yogurt to the match. These mind games extended beyond the board, creating an atmosphere of tension and anticipation that influenced the flow of the match. Facing off against Astralis, a titan in the realm of CSGO, Mouse Sports found themselves trailing with an 8-14 deficit on Dust2. Cannot weather this storm as soon as Astralis get their CT side going, it's just flowing. Mouse Sports T side, it's just not been able to break through two maps back to back. It was at this juncture that Kerrigan, renowned for his in-game leadership and tactical foresight, called for a time out. A pause that would soon become a pivotal turning point in the match. Money has been saved for this moment here. It's the final timeout for Mouse Sports. The timeout served multiple purposes. It was a moment for Mouse Sports to catch their breath, but most importantly, it was a strategic interlude for Kerrigan to recalibrate their approach and instill a renewed sense of purpose among his teammates. The psychological impact of this pause disrupted Astralis' momentum, planting seeds of doubt and forcing them to contemplate the potential shifts in Mouse Sports' strategy. What followed was a masterclass in adaptive strategy and mental fortitude. Not necessarily confirmed yet. Device may have something to say about it, but Woxic, quad kill, and the ninth for Mouse. They break their silence. Kerrigan's calls post timeout were not just reactions to the scoreboard, but were deeply rooted in an understanding of Astralis' tendencies, their pacing, and how to disrupt it. Mouse Sports began to claw back, round by round. We'll have to dig so deep at this point with the AWP, no kit, and he's gonna be spotted. Box gonna take him down as we tie things up to 14-14. Leveraging unexpected strategies and capitalizing on the slightest of openings. An embodiment of chess-like strategy on the digital battlefield of Counter-Strike. Six rounds in a row for Mouseport. They keep answering back here. He's in towards CT spawn. Woxix going to get the flank, surely. This is it. Mouseport have done it. They're going to the grand finals. The effectiveness of psychological warfare and bluffs in both chess and Counter-Strike hinges on the ability to remain composed under pressure and anticipate the opponent's reactions and to disguise one's true intention behind a veil of confidence. <laughs> It's a testament to the depth of strategic play in both games, where victory is not just a matter of tactical superiority, but also of winning the mental duel that ranges beneath the surface. The legendary endgame between Jose Capablanca and Frank Marshall in the 1918 match exemplifies mastery of their endgame subtleties. Capablanca maneuvered such precision that Marshall, 
even having an equal number of pieces, found himself in an unwinnable position. The power of pieces is not in how many you have, but in how well they work together and move, highlighting the strategic depth and foresight required to navigate these final stages. Counter-Strike's post-plan scenarios mirror the chess endgame's tensions and strategic complexity. The clock ticks down not just for the bomb, but for the player's nerves and strategies as well. A standout example is the 2019 IEM Katowice Major Final, where Astralis showcased unparalleled post-planned discipline against Ents. The orbs up and another smoke is down. How do they break through the force field of the smoke towards the arch side? On Inferno with a bomb planted, Astralis utilized their utility grenades with such strategic acumen, blocking vision and delaying attempts to retake, that Ents found themselves thwarted by the, both the ticking bomb and Astralis' tactical positioning. Lovely approach of Astralis, they've got so much money, so much momentum behind them, they get the apartment's control, one smoke out, a flashbang to follow, and they make things so difficult to contain. This scenario highlights how, similar to the chess endgame, victory in Counter-Strike often hinges on leveraging every available resource and positioning with purpose and precision. In the world of chess, the battle against the clock is as formidable as the opponent sitting across the table. This dual confrontation was never more evident than the 1972 World Chess Championship between Bobby Fischer of the United States and Boris Baxi of the Soviet Union. Held in Reykjavik, Iceland, this match was a focal point on the Cold War symbolizing the ideological clash between two superpowers, with each move on the board resonating far beyond the confines of the chess world. Fischer, known for his eccentricity and unparalleled chess skills, challenged the reigning champion Spaxi in what would become the match of the century. The tension was not just geopolitical, but intensely personal, with Fischer making extraordinary demands and even forfeiting game two. His strategic depth showcased through surprising opening choices like the Queen's Gambit in game six, a move he'd never played before in competitive play. This puts Baxi under immense pressure both on the board and on the clock. In chess, time management is crucial. Each player is given a fixed amount of time to make all their moves. Making a move stops your clock and starts your opponents. This dynamic adds a layer of strategy as players must not only plan for their moves on the board but also manage their time efficiently to avoid the dreaded time trouble. Which is basically where players are forced to make rapid decisions often compromising the quality of their play. Fisher's approach, especially after his comeback from an early deficit, embodied a masterful blend of deep strategic planning and psychological maneuvering, compelling Spaxi to spend valuable time contemplating responses to Fisher's innovative plays. This pressure was magnified by the match's high stakes, with every tick of the clock echoing the intense scrutiny from international audience. When Spaxi was faced with Fisher's unpredictable and aggressive strategy, he had to navigate not only the complex positions on the board, but also the dwindling minutes on the clock. The match unfolded with Fisher demonstrating not only superior strategic understanding, but also a keen awareness of the psychological and temporal dimensions of high-level chess. The 1972 championship was more than a series of games. It was a historic event that highlighted the intricate dance between time, strategy, and psychology in chess at the highest level. Of equal caliber among historical sporting events, in the heat of the 30th round of the third map in the grand final of the Ely Boston Major, phase on match point, Cloud9 found themselves one round away from securing overtime or facing defeat. North America had never become so close to winning such a prestigious event, a game mostly dominated by European players. FaZe, a super team made of European all-stars on the brink of winning it all. The critical moment arrived as the clock dwindled down, and the cast is highlighting the urgency of now iconic exclamation. But look at the time! Look at the time! There's seven seconds to blow the bomb! They're trying to build pyramids, but there's no more play! Stewie's won the round! We're going to have the time! Cloud9 have done it! How have they done that? They came back all the way! All the way! As FaZe attempted to plant the bomb in the dwindling seconds, Stewie 2K, wielding an op, emerged as the final bastion for Cloud9. His pivotal frags in those last seconds prevented the plant, securing the round, overtime, and ultimately, the championship for Cloud9. In chess, time pressure can force even the most seasoned grandmasters into errors, turning a winning position into a draw or loss. Much like in Counter-Strike, where a lapse in time awareness can derail a meticulously planned round. 
Teams must balance the dual objectives of outmaneuvering their opponents and adhering to the strict temporal confines of each round. Both games demand not just strategic foresight and tactical brilliance, but also an acute awareness of the clock, making time management integral skill akin to moving pieces on a board or holding angles. Counter-Strike, while it has seen updates and a sequel, maintains a similar core gameplay that has changed relatively little over the years, especially when compared to the rapidly evolving landscapes of games like Valorant. While I do enjoy playing Riot's TAC FPS, it's the stability of Counter-Strike that allows players and teams to cultivate a deep understanding of the game's mechanics, maps, and strategy. <laughs> Top teams thrive by mastering the nuances of utility and map control, showcasing a level of strategic depth and adaption that comes from years of competing within the same parameters. Their ability to adapt comes from a deep strategic understanding, not just the game mechanics, but of their opponents. The art of unpredictability and adaption in chess and Counter-Strike reflects a nuanced dance within a well-known arena. This highlights the profound appreciation for depth and stability that allows players to build lasting legacies and eras of competitive mastery that define these timeless games. Positioning in both chess and Counter-Strike transcends mere physical placement. It's a strategic doctrine that dictates the flow of battle, underpinning victories with silent, calculated moves. The silent role of the lurker in Counter-Strike emphasizes strategic positionings to disrupt enemy lines and gather crucial information. Players like Get Right became legends, not just for their aim, but their uncanny ability to be exactly where the enemies don't expect them to be, using positioning to sow chaos and dismantle strategic setups. The match between Fnatic and Ninjas in Pajamas at ASL1 Cologne 2014, specifically round 9 of map 3, showcases the paramount importance of positioning. In this round, NIP, trailing behind 5-3, initiates a B-set execute in a 3v3 scenario. Get Right, known for his lurking role, exemplifies the critical aspect of positioning by navigating through the defense unnoticed. Who throws out another grenade here, gets up another kill. Is it happening again? Pronax is alone, that bomb is in the middle of nowhere. He's gonna have to sit down at the open, he goes down! Get Right clutches it, it happens again! Oh my god, Get Right, he does it! This type of play that we just saw from Get Right, that is, that's classic right here, and if if that's what they're gonna pull up in the Grand Finals, Fnatic have gotta step up their A game. His ability to be where the enemy least expects parallels the role of a chess player who utilizes pieces not just for their physical presence on the board, but for the potential threat and control they exert over the game. His victory against Viswanathan Anand in 2013 World Championship came where Carlsen pushed his B pawn into White's camp, which led Anand to trade Rooks over the A file. Come on, Vichy. Okay, so we've had Rook A6, Knight A6. And I think we're going to see, right. we're either going to see F5, maybe he can take on B4, but I just don't like giving Black a tempo to bring his knight in. This sequence led to a highly complex position where Anand, despite having a promising start, lost his way in the complications. Is obviously considering Rook F4, and look how Magnus has kept the pressure on time-wise. Vish is going to have to make a decision now. If it doesn't work, it's all over. The World Championships are over for him. The climax of the game occurred with Anand's blunder on move 28, after which he had to resign, giving Carlsen a decisive lead in the match. He, he looked very nervous playing that move. So oh my Queen god! E1 right it's I think knight f1 is a huge is blunder. That a blunder. I think knight f1 is an absolute shocker. What? This game illustrates the importance of pattern recognition in two ways. Firstly, Carlsen's ability to navigate through the complexity of Anand's aggressive strategy without falling into a decisive trap, shows his deep understanding of the patterns and dynamics of the Nimzo Indian defense. Secondly, the critical mistake made by Anand, under pressure in a highly complicated position, underscores how pattern recognition is not just about identifying the opportunities, but also about avoiding potential pitfalls. Counter-Strike, with its ever-evolving landscape of maps and strategies, demands a similar mastery of pattern recognition. Elite players such as Simple distinguish themselves not just through mechanical skill, but through their ability to read opponents' movements and strategies based on subtle cues. Simple's intuitive play, anticipating enemy setups and countering them before they unfold, illustrates how pattern recognition transcends pure reaction speed, becoming a game of mental chess where knowledge of past patterns provides the foresight needed to control the future. 
Let's see if Double Smoke's in the same place there. Simple just jumping casually into the side. He's gonna fall down again. Oh! Right. What is this touch from Simple? Are you serious? What is that? You can't do that, Simple. That's not allowed. This is not FPL. This is a major. Chess and Counter Strike, each a titan in its own domain, exemplify the timeless allure of strategy and competition and community. Chess, an ancient game, has seen a remarkable renaissance thanks in part to Twitch streamers and content creators who've brought it into the digital age with flair and accessibility. Platforms like chess.com serve as modern day agoras, where millions converge to play, learn, and be part of a vibrant global community. This digital evolution has democratized chess, making it more accessible and engaging for people worldwide, further enriching its rich tapestry of culture and intellect. Counter-Strike, though younger, mirrors this communal spirit with a fiercely passionate audience that has evolved the game from a simple mod to a competitive gaming juggernaut. Its ecosystem thrives hugely on user-generated content, from Surf, KZ, Prac Maps, and even competitive maps, played on by the pros, all created by the community. Even the skins in the game designed and voted for by the community. On YouTube, you'll find strategy guides, utility lineups, and other tutorials fostering a culture of innovation and continuous engagement. Like chess, Counter-Strike celebrates its heroes, players whose skill and strategic prowess inspire others and elevate the game to an art form. Here he comes once again. The first base is a trend. He's going to hit the ground there. It's cold. Oh, what? A jumping double from Cold. What is there going on right now? How does he do this? Cold has saved Luminosity with the all-play. Unthinkable scenes there on the B apartments. These games with their deep roots in strategy and competition offer more than just entertainment. They are microcosms of society, reflecting the human quest for mastery, connection, and legacy. The communities that have formed around chess and Counter-Strike are testaments to their enduring appeal, proving that these games are not just pastimes, but pillars of culture that continue to evolve and inspire. I hope you liked the video. Thank you for watching. Please engage in the comments. Talk about Chess and Counter-Strike. I can't wait to see what more you have to say. Like and subscribe. Peace!